away. Right, so hello everybody, I'm Deborah. I am a self-employed ecologist. My background is in butterflies, as some of you might have seen last week, and um, dragonflies. And I gradually got more and more interested in plants and then eventually that led on to grasses. But I'm not a trained, um, I'm not a trained botanist. So I'm not an expert on grasses, but I hope I can teach you the first steps to, to the sorts of things that you have to notice and learn about grasses that then will open up that whole world to you. I've just noticed I'm, my, my date is slightly out of date by eight years, but never mind. <laughs> um, so just a bit of culture. And I love this very early photo that actually shows, um, certainly looks like Yorkshire fog there. So grasses, the, the whole group of grasses are known as the Poeaceae, and um, we've got about 160 species in the, in the UK. That's not including all the hybrids, but we're not going to worry about hybrids today. Um, obviously, a huge proportion of the food that the world eats are, grain, are grains from grasses. Um, they also provide the forage for most of our meat, or a lot of our meat, cattle and sheep, and also horses. I'm not talking about them as meat. Um, they're, they're important for, to learn about for all sorts of reasons. They can indicate the soil type, and they're also um, influenced by the soil type, mo moisture, the pH, um, which habitat you're in, how the site has been managed. So they're mainly wind pollinated, which means they're not reliant on pollinators. They have very light pollen, so it blows easily in the wind. And then they have these feathery prominent stigmas for the, the female um, reproductive organs to catch the pollen. Obviously they don't have petals or scent or nectar. Um, and that means they have very inconspicuous flowers. They are enclosed in chaffy scales, which we will learn a lot about today. And they just have a one seeded fruit. They never have more than one seed um, per floret, as it's called, per reproductive organ. Um, they're important vital food, uh, food plants for things like skipper butterflies on the bottom right and also um, uh, are brown butterflies in the UK. Uh, their um, resting sites, uh, roosting sites for other insects, and obviously their nest sites for many ground nesting birds, the harvest mice, all sorts of things. So grasslands are really vital and under great threat. So to start with, the tools you need, very simple really, the basic things you need are a hand lens, um, and it, any kind of magnifier, but it needs to be magnified to at least times 10 because there are small features that you um, do really need, need the lens to see. And um, uh, we can, we'll send you out some sort of handouts after the course with all this sort of detail. You don't have to write it down, but um, I'll refer to a very nice little short video um, that just shows somebody using it, how to use a hand lens. Basically, what you do is you hold the lens up to your eye and then you bring your specimen towards your eye until you get in focus and you can move it back and forth to get the focus right. Don't put the lens on the thing you're looking at. It won't give you anywhere near as good a view of it. Um, for really tiny features, you can also get a times 15 or a times 20 lens, but they're not essential and you can also buy um, double lens lenses so to speak that have a times 10 and a times 20 or sometimes you'll find a times 8 and a times 15. Um, and an ID guide those are the, the really important things that you do need to get um, to really learn and also you know use as you're out if you see new things and to verify you think you know what something is to double check what it is. Um, optional but quite useful things that um, so there's a woman who's Linda Weeks who um, taught two really good online um, courses for the Irish Grasslands Project about how to identify grasses vegetatively when they're not flowering and she suggested this which I thought was a really good idea to use a clear ruler and I was thinking you could just use um, 
some bit of plastic packaging, all that rubbish plastic that we get when we buy things rather than throw it away. You can just mark it off because you only need a really short length. Then you can actually lay it over because you want to look at the width and the length of various parts of the plant. And I think having a clear rule on putting it over is a lot easier than putting it alongside a window. Also a pocket knife can help because occasionally, as long as you're not looking at something rare, you actually might want to dig something up, just one or two specimens, just to have a look at, um, I'll talk about their stolons and, and rhizomes. Um, and also, it does take patience and it does take persistence. You just have to work at it. Uh, for people that were on the butterfly course last week, you have to work a bit harder today because there are a bit more um, terms that you need to use and become familiar with. So what here we see are the three kind of standard um, uh, books that cover a really, really excellent coverage of all of our grasses. Um, the middle and the left one also cover sedges and rushes and fern. The Hubbard on the right is the classic book. It's really daunting. It was a book that, that was suggested to me when I was first trying to learn about grasses and it's just got um, black and white illustrations. And um, it's a bit out of date now. Some of the names have been changed. Um, but it actually, once you get to learn about grasses, the illustrations are really, really good, really clearly show all the different parts of the grass. Um, I use the Francis Rose one. That's a, that's a hardback and it's a bit more expensive. None of these are pocket guides. Um, but I find that really helpful and it's got large illustrations. Um, I don't know the Collins one, but I think that's also really highly recommended. I think it's out of print, but I think it's just about to be reissued. So I think they're just between um, versions of that one. Um, these are simpler keys that have come out, some of them more recently, that are really, really useful. So we've got the um, Field Studies Council fold out, laminated fold out chart, which ha just has your, your mostly your common species, um, but really easy to take out in the field. Um, and it's actually got a sort of key on the back as well. So you look up a grass and that will indicate this is the one that has a pointy leaf tip or you know, various other features. Um, the Dominic Price book is very brief and um, really good on most species. Some of them, I think it doesn't have quite enough illustrations. Um, the Ireland's Biodiversity Guide, I just bought that um, a few weeks ago, so I've not used it much, but that looks really, really good and it's quite chunky but um, it's all laminated, really easy to find your way around. It's got a um, key for identifying them by their flowers, a very simple key, and also to identify them vegetatively. And um, although it's about Ireland, we've got more species here than in Ireland, but certainly all the common species will be the same. And there may be a few things that are more common there than here, um, but that looks really handy. And all of these are really inexpensive. And the final one, the Faith Anstey one, I don't know that book, but the Botanical Society of the British Isles um, has listed that on their website. And that's also inexpensive. Um, these are the more um, serious, your serious botanists. The BSBI handbook that covers all the grasses and hybrids as well. Um, and then the other two books cover all the plants. The Stace, that's an old edition. I think it's, I think it's on the fourth edition now, which is the sort of Bible. And the value of that for me is to double check things because it always it gives a very, very concise description of every plant. It does have all the hybrids, so it can be a bit daunting. And then the Poland and Clement book, which um, helps you identify any plant when it's not flowering. I'm um, just going to briefly talk about keys. I know they're something that um, can be quite scary at first, um, but they're a useful tool as you move on to really start learning about grasses or any, any other plants. Um, so your, your standard key is called a dichotomous key, which gives you two choices in, as, at each step. So it'll have option one, is it this one or this one? So it, in this example, it's not the, if it's not the first one, then it takes you to number two. And then again, you just keep selecting. The problem with that is it might come to um, the flower looks like this and that you don't have a flower on your specimen. So you're sort of stuck. Um, some of those 
simpler guys that I that I showed you um, divide it down much more simply. So the um, Irish book just looks at the whole sort of flower stock, the inflorescence, which I'll explain in a minute. So just the shape of that. And then it takes you to each section and then you just thumb through each section to look for the thing that your plant looks like. And it's got very brief descriptions of all the species. There's also a thing that um, the Field Studies Council have been developing, I'm sure other people as well, which are online multi-access key. So that helps you, um, you don't have to have all the features. So if you don't have flowers or, um, or you don't know how it's rooting, um, you just can click the things that you can identify. And then it keeps narrowing down the list for you. So it tells you what's on the right side. It tells you the most likely and the least likely and it sort of highlights the things you've ticked of where you match that plant. This is just to groups of British grasses, not to species. And, um, and then it all, it's also got lots of information you can click on um, the knowledge base and it just gives you a whole description of that grass. And then you click on, um, on the dactylus and then it gives you um, an illustration and some more descriptions. So I think those are really useful and they're kind of the way, the way to go for the future, I think they're really handy. Um, there's also a whole lot of online resources. We'll send this all to you. So I mentioned the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, which is a really good place to begin. And they've got um, lots of tips about plant identification for beginners. Um, you can read for yourself all these other, um, all these other sources of information. And also there's some really good Facebook groups. So there's a UK grasses, sedges and rushes group and also botanical keys and how to use them. Um, if you have a look for them and then you can post um, specimen, photos of specimens on you're having trouble with. It's always a good idea to try to identify it first for yourself. And then and people are very generous with their time and helping you um, identify them. And I mentioned the Irish Glossons Project and um, if you go to their website, you can see a link to, um, they have three grass identification videos that are excellent and also sedge ID. Yeah. Um, and also one day when we're all allowed to go out again, we'll all dress up like these people and um, go out and do what we should, we were meant to do in the first place. So Sue Breck had asked me to run a course that we were gonna run on Gower. I'm getting very hoarse already. We don't just start. <clears throat> I think we we're going to do this last month, <clears throat> but one day um, there's all these courses and events that you can go to and um, definitely put you in the way of the Glamorgan Botany Group who also have a Facebook page and the same thing, put up photos and people are come back very quickly and help you, help you with your identification. Um, I know they've just canceled all their outings for this year. Another little thing that I just added on. <clears throat> So you can make your own herbarium, your own collection, um, especially if you do go out with people and they, they definitely verify your specimen. Take it home, stick it in a book like a, I use a, 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 um, A3 art book and um, stick your specimens in and make notes and write obviously the name and who verified and, and where and when you collected them. And that can also help you when you um, uh, you uh, submit your records to SUBREC and other um, record centers, which I forgot to stick all those slides in. Um, but um, it's really, really important to get people's records. I think grasses are very under-recorded. Um, if you really want to make a really good herbarium, mine is a bit of a mess. Um, then you can look online for how to actually make a proper herbarium with proper museum quality on paper and um, how to stick the plants on. Don't glue them on. Don't use sticky tape. I use um, paper with like sticky at, the, at either end to, to hold them in place. And they're really useful because then at least you can go back and look at, uh, even if it's dead, it's a real specimen of the plant rather than a photograph or a um, illustration. So very briefly, just to tell you to start learning the difference between grasses, rushes, and sedges. We're not going to look at <clears throat> we're only going to look at grasses, so 
You may know this little rhyme, sedges of edges, rushes are little, grasses are hollow, no up from the ground. Um, and then of course, in the real world, that's generally true, but it's not always true. Um, so grasses are round or oval. They're never triangular, and this is in cross section. Um, and they're usually hollow between the nose, the little sort of knees, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and there you can see cross sections of the hollow grass, the round solid rush, not all the rushes are solid, and the triangular sedge. Um, and also, the, if, you, if you view them from above, very, very fine artistic um, illustrations by me. Uh, um, grasses have leaves in just two ranks of coming out opposite each other. Sedges, the triangular stem, and then um, leaves in three directions from each of the faces of that triangle. And then rushes um, spiral and star-like in many directions. And just to show you some illustrations of the grass, a rush and a sedge, the flowering parts of the three groups are very different, but I'm not going to um, talk about that in terms of their time for that. But they're quite easy to tell apart once you get to learn those parts. And um, just briefly, for beginners, um, taxonomy and what Latin names are actually about. Scientific names, which you'll probably say, because sometimes they are Greek as well. Um, so they're always showing you the genus and the species. So you can read through from top to bottom the monocotyledons, which are all the plants with one seed leaf when, the, when they first germinate and send out a leaf, they only have one leaf. Um, whereas all our flowering plants are dicotyledons, which have two leaves. So it's the grasses, um, all the poiaceae. Poaceae and um, things like orchids, things like that are monocots. Um, so the family of grasses is Poaceae. The genus is the first name. So the example um, I've got shows you the Anthoxanthum, vernal grasses. And then the species name also often gives you a characteristic of that particular species. So Odorotum is sweet vernal grass. It's got a, a lovely. Um, that lovely hay scent, which is why, where they get their name and where they get their Latin name. Um, right, so here's where you have to do a bit of work. Um, so the basic parts of the plant, and you do need to, there's not that many really, but you do need to learn them because you will read them in your, in your descriptions. The overall plant, really simple. The cone is the flowering shoot. Um, the node, as I mentioned, is the, um, sort of swollen joint um, and leaves originate from the nodes. Um, and then you've got, so some of them just have roots. Some of them spread by overground renders called stolons, usually horizontal. And some of them spread by underground stems um, called rhizomes. And then they send up shoots called tillers. And grasses grow from the base rather than the tip of the plant, which is why they're so, um, they thrive being cut or grazed because they'll just keep regrowing. Um, then to go down a more specific level. So the leaf is called a blade. And then the sheath is the lower part of the leaf. So it encloses and protects the younger shoots below. Um, and sometimes it has a, um, it's actually like folded. You can see that one part overlaps another down like that. Um, and then you've got the oracles, which if we see the, the photo on the top right, they're um, sort of bristles or, or sort of clasping appendages that come around from the leaf and around the front of the stem. Um, not all grasses have them, but they can be really helpful in identification. That's why these, these terms are important to use because they really help in identification. And the other one that we'll hear about a lot is ligules, which are a little um, growth from 
the base of the blade, so between the blade and the stem. And they're either membranous, they can be really long and ragged like this example, they can be very short, um, and sometimes they can just be a fringe of hairs, and sometimes there's no ligule at all, or it's so small you can't see it, or later in the year it might have even fallen off. Um, and that's why, and in, in all these cases, you should look at several shoots um, and even several different different plants, just because everything's variable and things may have may have been damaged. Um, I've always been told that you only look at the non-flowering shoots, but in various courses I've been on recently, people didn't seem to, to, to think that was important. So I think you can look at any shoot. Um, and just again, another just a different, um, it's a different illustration of the same the same features of the grass plant inflorescence. I'll go on to talk about in a minute, and then just sort of um, highlighting the oracles. Where we've got examples on the left in the middle of different different sizes of oracles, just a, a range of them. Um, the ligules on the top, long, short, absent. Um, can also be hairy. And then the other thing, and some of the, um, another approach to, to dividing grasses up, um, to divide them into groups to make it easier to start identifying them, oops, um, is to look at the youngest leaf shoot or the leaf, leaf bud and see whether the, the new leaf coming out is coming out folded or rolled, and I hope you can see those little illustrations that actually show if you're looking at a cross section that it's rolled around itself or that it's folded over itself. And that can really help you divide things into two groups. So the reproductive parts will start at the small end of the individual flowers, which are called a floret, so very, very, very reduced um, from what our idea of a flower is. Um, you probably may remember from your school botany courses, the female parts are the stigma and the ovary, um, also called a pistil, and that, when that germinates, it produces the single seed. And then the male parts are the stamen, usually three, not always. Um, and the, the sort of stalk of the stamen is the, is the filament and the part that produces the um, pollen is the anther. Um, those aren't generally very important in identification. What, it, what does come up sometimes are these two papery scales that surround each individual floret, each individual flower. So the um, outer one is the lemma and the inner one is the paleo. And sometimes they have an on, as you can see in the bottom picture, which is just a little spike, almost like a little hair. And sometimes they bet they have a bend in them or not. Those things can help you in identification. Um, not on the paleo, but they often are on the bloom. I mean, sorry, they're often on the lemma. And then um, I'll go on to explain what the glooms are on the next slide. So a spikelet is a small spike of one to many florets all coming off the central axis. Um, and then around the whole spikelet enclosing all those florets are the glooms. So there's two more papery scales on the very outer part. And again, an, a lower, an upper, or inner and outer. Sorry, I don't know where those wind and blue words have come from. Um, so there, they enclose the whole group of florets and just an example of again a very artistically drawn um, illustration of um, a spikelet which is two florets in it and one with six but you get from you get a whole range of numbers of them but just to, to give you an idea and that's um, that's something that's taken me a long time to really get my head around it just have the patience as I said patience is so important to um, to really learn these terms and learn to be able to see with your hand lens the difference between the glooms and each floret and counting the florets and, and things like that. Then the whole thing, I'm sorry, these, these inners and outers, ignore them. Um, the whole thing, so all the flowering parts are called the inflorescence, the entire flowering part of the grass. 
So um, probably the most common way that those are structured are a panicle. So you've got the spikelets, each one enclosing one or many florets. They're all arranged on branches off from the central, um, the central branch. Um, I'm sure there's a term for that, access. <laughs> access. Um, a racing where each individual spikelet is stalked directly on the main axis, not, or not, not off of a separate branch. Some of the ID books don't even use that term racing, they just use a panicle for both of those. Or a spike where the spikelets are directly on the main axis, um, either a, a Timothy or a foxtail, or um, uh, We've got the yellow oak grass, but they're coming right off the main stem. And again, so all these these learning these things really helps you divide things into different groups, so you know where to look, and that you can eliminate um, a lot of a lot of other grasses that don't fit the look of your specimen. Right. So to quickly, I know this, this is a lot, there's a lot to fit in. So I feel like this is a bit of a whirlwind tour and I hope um, it's not overwhelming you too much. But um, um, just to, to work through the steps that um, to identify the grass you're looking at. So one thing is what habitat are you in? Are you in a dry limestone grassland? Are you in a wetland? Um, and all range in between and they can help you identify. So if you're on the Gower Coast and, and there's, you're looking at the grass and it says it's only found on bogs, then obviously it's not that grass and it really helps you um, cut out a lot of other species that you don't need to be looking at. Also, um, if your book has it, or if you're really not sure, look up the distribution. Um, but usually they don't have a description to say. So there's, um, there's like a grass, blue moor grass, which is very common in Scotland and not common in Wales. So um, something like that, again, if you think you've got it, then you, you may. Yeah, I mean, I can't say it's definitely not here, but you want to be really careful and you probably have something else. Um, and then um, we talked about, um, sorry, no, ignore what I just said, um, looking at the life cycle. So that, and that's also something that I've always struggled to really get my eye in for what the difference is. But you've got some grasses that are annuals, so, they grow for a year and then they die, like any meadow grass, which you'll see and hopefully you will recognize because it's extremely common. Um, and um, so almost all the shoots have a flower on them. And then you won't see any remnants of the previous year's growth. You won't see dead leaves underneath it usually. A perennial, which lives for you, they're, they're, I won't, there's also biennials, but we won't worry about them. Perennial lives for three or more years. So not all the shoots flower. And often you can see the remnants of the, um, the year's sheaths around the base, so that papery covering around the bottom of the stalk, or also in this example, put more grass, which is um, actually you can see the previous year's dead leaves um, underneath the new screen growth. So that's so you know that's a perennial. And this is what I was going to jump on to say, whether it's tufted or creeping, and that really, really can, um, again, help you divide your grasses up and eliminate, um, you know, save your time not looking at grasses that, that aren't, aren't um, in the right category. So you've got very tufted grasses, um, tufted hair grass there on the left. Um, that's just an individual plant, and so they tend to be more dotted about, but you can get a whole field full of them too. Um, and then the ones that creeping that generally you tend to see that they've really spread out. Sometimes you can even see that they've spread out in a line to cover a large area, either by the above ground stolons or the underground rhizomes. And that's why I suggested a knife where sometimes if you really can't work it out, you might want to just try to pry up um, an individual grass to see whether it's got a stolon or a bison carefully and not if it's something unusual. Um, the sheath can be really helpful, especially hairiness, whether it's hairy or not. Um, and when we get to the fescues, you'll see what I mean by whether it's closed or open. And also the um, 
at, again, the sheath at the very bottom, sometimes it's very characteristic. So we see Yorkshire fog, which has these um, red stripes, sort of pinky with red stripes, stripy pajamas. Um, and we'll see the example of yellow of grass in a minute. The stem itself is less variable, so it's not that important a characteristic. Sometimes the nodes can be um, useful. So creeping soft grass has hairy nodes. Really easy to then divide it from a similar species, Yorkshire fog. Um, then the leaves, the leaf blades. So I've already talked about rolled and folded. That's, that's a really helpful thing. And then you can read for yourself all these other um, features. Hairiness is important. Sometimes the ribs or whether they're opaque. Um, I'll mention tram lines when we get to meadow grasses. Um, and then the tips, sometimes the tips of the leaf blade. Whether they're gradual or sudden, whether they're very sudden, and the meadow grasses are sort of hooded, and I'll show you a good photo of that in a minute so you can see what I mean, but they're keeled like a boat. Um, legules are friends of legules, which you'll hear a lot about. Um, and you can see two really obviously different examples of a short truncate legule, which means it's sort of quite um, almost cut off at the top, um, or one that's all hairs. Um, and also the length and the width, so again, why that little clear ruler would be handy. And the oracles, whether or not they're there clasping around. Um, sometimes they can be very small. And, and difficult to see. Then the inflorescence, which you all know now, is the whole group of spikelets, each of which is holding one to many florets, which, what sort of um, arrangement they're in. And also sometimes they can change, so they can change in the season. That is one tricky thing that grasses do, but they need to finish at different times. So um, sometimes they're always loose and open, sometimes they're quite dense and compact. Um, but sometimes they can be closed and then they open up and they flower and then close again. Um, the spikelets, how many flowers um, they might have in them, and it, how many flowers or where they're arranged can really give you a look at the plant. So they can be on this common bent that has just got one flower per spikelet and it makes it look very sort of light and and open. Um, other plants have um, their spikelets right at the end of the stalks and they can look a bit clumpy. Um, and um, yeah, on, uh, altogether, the color can, can be very helpful. Um, and we'll see later purple moor grass and red fescue, particularly what's flowering now, and it can make a whole field look red. Um, and the glooms, um, again with the hand lines, so you can see those glooms at the bottom of that floret in the photo. Um, and whether or not they have arms is, is uh, often a really helpful um, feature. And then within, down to the level of each floret, also the lemma and the palea. Um, sometimes hidden within those outer glooms, sometimes it stands above, and, and the awns as well, either at the tip or the back, coming from the back can help you um, identify your feature. Um, I think the paleo less often. Right, we're gonna have another drink. So now we're gonna move on to actually look at some particular grasses. I've tried to keep this list as short as possible to just mainly focus on common grasses that you come across. Hopefully some that you'll see it and think, oh right, I know about what that one is. Um, but there's also a few sort of quite characteristic plants that we get in South Wales that I've stuck on at the end. So I hope you will hang around for that, but if not, I understand. Um, right, so we start with fine, some fine leaf grasses, the fescues. Um, red fescue, very common, and here you can see the photo of how it can make the whole, the whole field look very, very reddish. Um, they both have very bristly leaves, but the red fescue also has sort of um, broader, normal-shaped leaves on the um, flowering stems, so that's 
if it's flowering, then you can saw them apart quite easily. Um, sheep's fescue is on more nutrient or glossy, so that's more of a habitat indicator. The common species don't really indicate much about a habitat because they're everywhere. Um, and um, what I was saying about the sheaths being open or closed. So I hope you can see on that photo how the one side of the top of the sheath sort of overlaps the other. And if you pull the stem down, it should just gently, it should just open up. Whereas the red fescue, it's closed. So if you try to pull the stem down, it will actually tear. And I remember that by their Latin names. Festuca ovina, as in sheep, um, O for open, and rubra, red, for R for width. Um, another very common grass, often I know a garden weed um, is the common cooch or couch grass. Um, it spreads by underground rhizomes, which is one of the reasons, features that makes it a weed because it spreads really well from runners underground so that they're, they're really hard to dig up and remove. Um, the spikelets <coughs> are um, sort of overlapping. So you can see each spikelet containing the florets sort of overlap each other. Um, and they're side on flat to the stem. They sort of have a, yeah, they're side on flat to the stem. And then um, Kevin Widowson, who, um, if you're on Twitter, I would recommend following him. Um, and he's also involved in the Facebook page, How to Use Botanical Keys. He's really brilliant at all, all sorts of plants, um, just, just photographing all the different features and, and putting it all together in one place for you. So you can see, you can read through your cell, you can read that all, all the different features that he's pointing out, um, how hairy the leaf is, um, the node doesn't have hairs. Different, so he's always got the, the features of the flowering plant on the left and these that he's, he's allowed me to use and then the leaves and the stems on the right. Um, another very common grass, perennial rye grass. Um, and it's also sown a lot in improved pastures um, and also in immunity grasses, plant fields and parks and things. It's got very shiny dark green leaves. So sometimes you can really see like a whole field just glowing, just shining in the sun. Um, and that's perennial ryegrass. It's probably also had lots of nutrient fertilizers on it to get it to grow very vigorously. Um, in that case, the spikelets barely overlap and they're all on one side. Um, and it's got these oracles as well. Oops, sorry. Apologies if my pointer runs. We come to the poa, the meadow grasses. So that's that's when I was talking about um, oak shaped or hooded tips, where you can see that it it sort of folds round. Um, and also they've got a visible central leaf groove, which people sometimes refer to as tram lines. You need to hand lens to look at that. I actually I find that a bit difficult to see. And also the um, the um, panicle, so it's got a panicle and it's very open and often described as Christmas tree like. And with that clumpy look with the several florets. Um, so this is so common. Annual meadow grass grows everywhere and, and all along pavements and, and all over the place. Um, it tends to flower, it actually flowers year round now. Um, and it's usually very small, but it can grow larger in. Um, richer soil. It's often got um, these wrinkly leaves, which is very, really, really good character, very characteristic. Um, you can see all these other features, but um, that should be very familiar, quite white, whitish looking uh, florets as well. Um, I'm not going to go over these, but just so you know, there's a number of other common meadow grasses. These are two bigger ones, but I think in the to save you or on brain space, we'll skip past those just so you know that these are also very common. And on to Coxfoot, another really common species that grows all over the place. Large tussocky plant. Um, the um, 
make sure I use the right term, the panicle is meant to um, look like a cock's foot in, in three parts. I struggled to get a photo that showed that really clearly, but um, and you should you should recognize that one. And it's very it's lower sheath, like on the noun flowering sheath is very flattened. I don't know if you can see that. I've tried to turn this um, this one sideways. You can actually see it's very, very narrow. You can just, or if you just use your fingers and just, just start from the base up, you can feel it's very, very flattened. So it's got a sort of almost oh, very, very oval, sort of pointed oval um, cross section. So those two features alone are, make it really easy to identify. It will change. It will look almost like pinky purpley. Uh, when it's first flowering, and then it uh, tends to remain on the on the stalk when it dies, and and can go quite white looking. Um, another common grass um, that's all over my garden is false oak grass, um, and that's got very swollen roots, often quite yellowy, or the uh, um, yeah, the very swollen stem base, not the roots, but just above the roots. Um, so that's a really good feature to identify it. It's got a bent on, uh, which you can just about see here. It comes up and then goes off at an angle. Um, it's very, it's a lovely, it's a lovely flower, very dangly, whitish flowers. Um, and Yorkshire Fog, again, really, really common. Very hairy plant. That, that, that's the, the really good thing to remember. Again, it starts off pinkish and goes whitish later in the season. And it's got those stripy pajamas at the base. Um, I'm to repeat that photo on here, but on um, pink and white stripes. So just remember the stripy pajamas. That will help you. Uh, I'm just looking to see. Yeah, just a hairy stem, hairy leaf, hairy sheath all over the place. Lovely, really lovely, soft, nice to run your hands along. And it's relative creeping soft grass. We saw this photo earlier. It's got very hairy nose. Um, and the silly thing to help remember it is it's, its Latin name is Holcus mollis. Molly has hairy knees. But um, a really good, good way to help identify it. It tends to favor acid grasslands a bit more. So it helps um, as a habitat identifier. And on to bent grasses. I find uh, it's taken me a long time to uh, learn bents or feel comfortable with bents. I'll tell you a story. My first job when I was hired to do plant surveys, so quadrats, if you remember doing those at school or at university, um, and for reasons beyond everybody's control, I couldn't start, I wasn't allowed to start until late August after the field had been cut. And I was just, horrified and the person that I was working for said, oh, I find it quite easy to identify grasses a few weeks after they've been cut. So I had to learn very quickly how to identify plants when they weren't flowering. And there were lots of bent grasses. So I spent a lot of time looking at bent legules. So I'm going to show you two of our, two of the, the two common bents, one called common bent, commonly enough. Um, it's very common, but it likes sites with low nutrients so it's not going to be in an enriched fertilized grassland it's drier slightly more acid grassland than heaths but also it's on calcareous so this the low nutrients which is is the thing that it likes and therefore that it, that it's indicating that it's not been fertilized um so that um the two features to tell them apart are um Looking at the ligule, you can see here, it's got quite a short, wide ligule. So it's wider than long. That sort of phrase you'll come across a lot um, in grass ID, uh, looking at the ligule, so wider than long, or longer than wide. So this one's wider than long. And also the panicle is always open, as you can see here. It's always, it's always open, even early in the year, or, or, or certainly, it probably starts close up, but early in the year or late in the year as well. And we can just see a, a field where you can see that very open um, panicle. A uh, creeping bent, the other common one. And um, it um, spreads by stolons, I believe. 
You can see it's spreading here, called creeping. And yeah, definitely stolons. That's why it's called stolonifera. Um, and that is very common. Um, doesn't like very acid grasslands. Um, so the features to tell the difference are that it's got a very long panicle, so it's longer than wide. And also that the flowers are only open when it's flowering, and then they close up again. So if you see a bent with a long panic, a long um, legio, and it's closed up, then it's a creeping bent. So stolons and common bent. Let's just go back. Spreads by rhizomes. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, I'm going to move to a few more. Um, a bit like the bent as well. They're not uncommon at all. They're quite common, but they are uh, favor certain ni nicer grasslands and you know more species rich grasslands. Um, crested dog's tail. I love crested dog tail. Really easy to identify. It's a really good one to start with. Um, and it likes neutral grasslands and meadows. It is sown, but it, it does indicate a nicer, nicer grassland. Um, and it's got this very characteristic um, um, spike, the panicle spike, cluster, all, all the um, off one central um, axis. And um, it's one sided, so it's sort of got a bad. If you turn around, you can see if you're looking at it, you see here, if you're looking at it on the back, you can see it's actually got a back to it. Um, and if you shake it around, especially when it's older, when it's brown, it looks like a Labrador's tail, wagging tail. The deadhead persists for a long time, so even later in the season, you can still find it easily. Lovely grass. Um, and another one, I've mentioned that before, um, sweet vernal grass, it's um, said to give that the scent to, to mown hay, that lovely hay scent. And it's got also got a, a spike, um, persists for a long time. The flowers very early in the year, but it persists for a long time. And although it's quite common, it can't indicate uh, um, a, a nice, it's found in nice grass. And, and it's oracle, if you can see, are um, these little hairs, little sort of whiskers on the sides of the um, oracle. Right, and we come to two similar looking spiked grasses, but Timothy on the left. There's also smaller cat's tail, which is very similar to Timothy's, so quite only you can tell them apart slightly by the ligule, but mainly by the size. Um, so Timothy is very common in neutral grass. It is often so, but it's, um, it's a lovely grass. Uh, it's got this um, sort of microphone-like inflorescence, quite tall. And the glooms, so if you remember the glooms, they're the two scales at the base of each spikelet. Um, and they have two arms on them on either side. So they are um, for two as something like Batman's ears, if you can see that, double on again. Um, and the um, smaller cat's tail also has that, those glooms. So you can see that with the hand it's really easily. Um, metal fox tail, it's very similar, but it's only got a single on um, from each floret. Um, so from the lemma, you look at that closely, you can definitely cannot see that those Batman leaves. Um, but it's got a similar shape, cylindrical head. Um, it's sort of knee joints, meaning it's sort of bends at the knees. Um, so those are your two very similar species. Another really lovely grass. Doesn't really look like anything else. There's, I think there's a couple of rare quaking grasses. This is a one you look most likely to come across. And it really quakes, it really kind of shakes and dangles, blows in the wind. Um, on dry chalk and limestone grasslands and meadows and fens, a really good habitat indicator. I'm always very happy to see that, and partly because it was, certainly it was one of the first grasses that I could identify. Um, you can see for yourself all the other features, but it, as long as it's flowering, there's nothing you can mistake it for. It's got these very plump little spikelets. You can see the shake of the wind and the candle clay purple. So, the 
this should be our um, this could be our South Wales um, South Wales favorite plant, most common plant, purple moor grass, which you'll find on our heaths and our moors and our fens. We've got a uh, habitat for purple moor grass and rush pasture named after it, called a grass pasture in Wales. Um, and it's a big tussocky grass. Um, as we saw very early on, um, it uh, deadlies persist over winter. In fact, they, they're quite straw color and quite they actually can go quite curly, so it can look very white over winter. But the um, fresh and fluorescent has a very purpley look, so that's how it gets its name. And um, I really struggled to find a good photo, but its ligule is just a fringe of hairs. Uh, I'm sorry if you can't you can't see that, but it's important to remember when comparing it with the one other similar plant which is the tufted hair grass that likes slightly drier soils, damp soils, but not really wet. Purple moor grass can, can tolerate very wet to damp. So they do overlap. Um, so tufted hair grass, another big tussock. Um, the edges of the leaves are very, very rough. So if you very carefully run your fingers down the edges, it, I mean, it could it could cut your finger. Or it feels like it could cut your finger. It's got teeth on them. Um, if you look at, um, you can see how ridged the leaf is. That may be part of it, although it's, it's actually the edges I'm talking about. Um, and it's got a very long point of lichen. So it's a big tussocky grass with a long legule, then it's tufted hair grass. And if it's got hairs instead of uh, do at all then I'll be put to um, Characteristic grass of our uplands, matte grass. Also really easy to identify when it's in flower. I don't think there's anything else that looks like that. That's the flower. So it's just it's almost like little spikes like coming off one central um, uh, from one side of the axis. Um, and also it um, it has these sort of, you can see the sheaths at the base of tussocks and then the bristly leaves are bent at right angles. It's very bristly and very pointy. If you tap the top of it with your hand, you can feel those points. Um, it's very, very tough. I think it's got silica in it. Um, so sheep don't eat it. They don't like it. It's probably really uncomfortable to eat. And so I'm trying to find you a, a photo I could use of our Welsh uplands covered in that grass, usually very, very sh short. Um, if it's short grazed, it's not that grass. Anywhere where it's longer, it tends to be not grass because it's the one thing that, that sheep won't eat. Sorry, that's not a very good photo. I, that, was, that was late last minute trying to source that photo. Um, and then finally, you'll be relieved to know, these are the last pair we're gonna look at. Um, and again, because the ligule, the ligule just really helps you divide them really easily. So we've got common reed. Um, likes likes actually to have its feet in water or right on the edge of water, a whole range of watery habitats. Big nodding panicle. Um, and its ligule are just hairs, very hairy. Reed canary grass likes damp habitats rather than very, very wet. But it can look, the photo doesn't quite do it justice. It can look um, quite similar. I was really stumped doing a survey once. Um, it was a hillside, but it was where um, soil had been um, um, dredged from the bottom of the lake and dumped, so lakeside. Or, um, and it just looked so much like common reed, but you know, I could feel it wasn't the right habitat. And then I remembered to look at the lake. So it's got this um, long, sort of blunt, membranous ligule. Sometimes you find like this example, they get torn. Sometimes they're always torn, but sometimes they do just get torn through wear. When you're when you bend up, then also I forgot to mention, to see the ligule, just very carefully bend the leaf back. And again, I mentioned the beginning and repeat again, look at different, um, different examples, look at different plants and different stalks, um, just to make sure that you're not um, looking at a damaged one or or something that just is very important. So there you have it. There's our grasses. Um, so thanks all of you for attending. Um, just the one 
real advantage of not doing this in the field is that we can have as many people as we want. So I think there were 100 people uh, booked on this. Obviously, thanks very much to Sue Brett for holding this and the butterfly course. And all the very generous photographers that have allowed me to use their photographs. Um, if you want to know about any further courses I'm running next year or maybe more online courses this year, um, have a look at my, particularly my Facebook page or my Twitter feed. Um, I'll just do a plug saying I'm doing a, a um, Dragonfly course, Dragonfly ID course, next Friday at 10 o'clock for the West Wales Biodiversity Information Center as well. So WWBIC, if you look there, if you want to look on that. And that is me finished. So time for questions. Thanks, Deborah. That was really, really Ooh. useful. Thank you. I oh, um oh, oh, it wasn't even an hour. Well, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I didn't talk too fast. No, it was perfect. I am. Okay. Um, I'm a total grass beginner and a bit scared of grasses, so that was really helpful for me. I am, um, especially going through the um, the different terms that I see and are scared of in ID books, going through them and actually learning what they mean. I think I might have to come back and watch it on YouTube and revise them before yeah. I. Uh, and I think that's right. I think I, I tended to think, oh, oh, I just want to look at the picture and see what it looks like, and it's taken me a long time to realize it really pays to take the time go back and look at the beginning of the book but you know all these guides will have should have a glossary so it's you know if you forget you always have a you can always um refer back to them but if you just can learn those and just start looking at things with your hand lens really carefully you're, you're just going to be steps ahead um so yeah awesome um we did have some questions whilst you were talking in the chat um so Joe Murphy asked, um, it was during, this question came up during the, um, when you were going through the ID steps section of the course, and Joe asked, would you apply the same ID techniques when looking at sedges and rushes? Um, not all of them, but a lot of them. Maybe we should do a, well, I don't know, <laughs> volunteering myself to do a sedge and rush course, but... <laughs> We could do that in a different course. So there are there are some of them are the same, but a, a lot of them are different. Um, yeah. Um, Jeremy White also asked, um, ID guide mentioned annual and perennial grasses, but are there any biennial grasses? I think there are, but I've skipped by them. <laughs> I think not not I think not very many. I mean I've not I don't think I've ever come across that when I've looked up a grass in the book, but I think there are a few. And then um, Jenny just asked, what was the name of the person recommended to follow on Twitter? I didn't write it down either. Oh, right. <laughs> Kevin Widow Son, as in Widow Son. Yeah, really good. There's also somebody called Mick Crawley, C-R-A-W-L-E-Y, I think, on Twitter, who also does the same thing. He'll pick um he'll pick he tends he'll pick like a group of related species not just grasses but any, any plants and sort of do a do a um uh what do you call it a thread and show you okay so this one looks like this this one looks like that and it's really really helpful cool um that's all the questions that came up during does anybody have any more questions now we're at the end you can either type them in the chat and i'll read them out or if you want to be brave and take off your microphone and ask deborah you can do that as well No. You must have covered everything, Deborah. <laughs> I can't believe that. Either that or people are just so bewildered. <laughs> um, There's lots of people coming up saying thank you in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, or I see somebody saying about grass of the garden. Absolutely, I, I I forgot to mention that. It's a really it's a really good way to start. And also then you can like start early in the year and start noticing as they first start coming up and then you you just get to know them better and better. You you can see them before they start flowering. Then they flower and you think, oh yeah, that, that looked like that. And yeah, and it's there on your doorstep, especially now when we're not going out very much, um, to keep keep looking at them and keep learning. Yeah. Um, Sandra's just asked, what information is being mailed after the course, please? Um, I'll send, or my colleague Elaine will probably actually do it because she's way better at emailing lots of people than I am. Um, mm. Send out um, the link to this course on YouTube and any other things that people have specifically 
asked for leave included in the last one. So, um, and Deborah, for the butterflies, you gave us a um, like a resources, a few slides on yeah. resources, and you get yeah, I'll see about that. Do the same. Yeah, the thing ID guides and websites and things like that. I did mention apps. Um, I think I I'd be very very careful about using there are there are um, apps where you can take a photo of a plant like there's one called seek s-e-e-k which is not bad i've just been trying that a bit but i really suspect that they struggle more with grasses but you could have a go with them but anyway i'll send you i'll send you all the details of all the resources and all the website addresses um kate jenkins has just asked which id book did the plates come from that you used in the id features for each grass they came from Wikimedia Commons, so they're old. Um, and I've, I've put, if you watch, I suppose watch the video again, I've put the name of the artist, but if you just Google the plant and illustration, you'll, you'll come across those. I find them really handy because they show all the different features. Yeah, yeah, some of them are lovely. But the, um, um, Hubbard grasses, that kind of old Bible has really, really good, very, very clear illustrations in it. Um, so yeah, if you're if you really want to get into grasses, it is it is worthwhile looking at it. Well, what I was wondering, sorry if I missed this and you did cover it. When you go to say garden center and you buy lawn seed in a packet. Is there any particular types of grass that are usually in that? If you see, if you just seed your own lawn, would I would you be able to it, tell what you were likely to get? <laughs> I would think it would likely be a lot of um, perennial ryegrass and um, red fescue for, for a fine leaved grass. I mean, I've never actually bought them, but it would be a very few species of grass. But you can get meadow uh, meadow collections. And um, ideally, you know, from a wildflower um, nursery or, you know, seed supplier or organic seed supplier, somebody like that, that, that then you can get an, a much nicer variety of grasses. Oh, right. If there's not any more questions then, then I think we'll wrap it up. Say thank you very much, Deborah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks thank everyone you. for joining us. Thank you, Amy.